Content warning. This podcast is intended for a mature audience, contains graphic descriptions of violence and explicit language. Hello, friends, and welcome back to Pods of the Multiverse. We're an unofficial D&D podcast where four friends played d and <laughs> I'm Andy, and I'm the DM for the adventures in the world of Theros. I'm here with my friends and the players for this game, and May, too... And we're going to talk campaign one wrap up. Let's get into it. You are the DM or you were the DM? Well, well, we're I, mean, I, think, we've, and I think we've made it clear are. that December 2022 or something, <laughs> we're going to be back here. You know, Actually, July 4th, 2022. Oh, July 4th, 4th 2022. Right. Nice. Yes. Like, like, nice. I, like I mentioned in the finale's table talk. I didn't spend the last 20 minutes of the last game setting up all that shit for nothing. Ashiok. So, yeah, season five confirmed. Mm. Season, <laughs> season five is confirmed. It's going to be it's going to be pretty hot. So, yeah, you are the DM. That's cool. That's Thanks. Cool. <laughs> so Do all of that to arrive at this point. Yeah, I'm glad we had. I'm glad we figured it out. Also confirming Andy as the DM for season five. Right. Mm. Pretty cool. Mm. Yeah, I'm cool. hype. And by the end of this episode, we'll confirm the DM and setting for season two. But you get five first. That's pretty cool. <laughs> what other what other show will promise you five seasons in advance what it's gonna be? The Cape. Wa- <laughs> the Walking Dead, probably? Like that shit's been going Sorry, on that for was an a, eternity. That was a terrible community. Also, reference. wait, what what is the Cape? The Cape? You don't know yeah. what the Cape is? I've seen almost every episode of Community. I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay, so the Cape was a show in the early 2010s. Okay, right, I think, and it was about a, a like a superhero, and his superpower was cape fighting, which is actually a, a legitimate martial art, right? Uh, cape and sword fighting um, was actually quite popular. In the like early Renaissance, do you uh, because fight? <laughs> because do you... the cape was a good thing to have in your offhand. You could you know you could trap oh. someone's weapon with it while you stabbed think, them. Think Doctor Strange, Jeff. Um, okay, so you fight and with that's your cape. Kind of the, you the tradition that Zorro comes out of, right? But Batman, so right. this was Zorro, but as a superhero, right? And. Um, I thought it was yeah, someone yeah, that magical fights cape capes. fighting powers, and his arch nemesis <laughs> was a guy who was good at chess. Um, <laughs> so, and he used did he did he did he use his cape to just knock the chessboard pieces down to the floor? Exactly. That Check was the, that was the entire May. tension: capes versus board games. Capes um, win every the, time, but, but in the end, board games won because the show was canceled. So let's oh. talk about a board game. Dungeons and Dragons <laughs> that we have played now. That's yeah. a fun segue. <laughs> That's as good a tra- segue as we're going to get. <laughs> hey, they're better than most of the table talk segues. So, uh, because it's yeah. not mine. Mine are terrible. All right. Um, yeah. So we did a season. So uh, I think I think what we want to do here is sort of break it down by like three episode chapters or acts, which is more or less how I sort of structured the narrative of these games. Um, so starting with the first one, the first three episodes, The Red Thread of Fate, Rocky Beginnings, and Omens in the Flames. Mm-hmm. Thoughts, feelings about the first arc, first act. Man, those those bindings for Gron. <laughs> <laughs> that was the hardest encounter of the whole campaign. It didn't get any harder than that. Yeah, it kind of did color what what came next. <laughs> and then I, I, this hasn't been really brought up, but you know, while we're talking about that scene there, Gron murdered an Acroan soldier just right out of the gate. The, Didn't the, even the care. The pancake. Yeah. Yeah. The pancake yeah. happened. Yeah. It never really got brought up again. <laughs> even though. Yeah, I don't think. Um, I don't think anybody sort of realized that you were the same Minotaur there. You know, because there were like hundreds of them. Also, everyone who saw you probably died. Yeah, that's oh. fair. That's that's they, that's they, a fair they, guess. Yeah. You know, but rest assured, Gron can be at peace knowing that that poor pancake man 
was burnt in the pyre and, you know, given a good a good send off. That's true. Yeah. He's you did a kindness, just like yeah. He's with Perforos now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he's with good, good on Gron. Good on Probably Gron. Probably Erois, but more more or yeah. less. You know what? Same yeah. sure. Honestly, that death he never saw coming. He didn't feel anything. You did him a mercy. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Honestly, it was more scary for the dude standing next to unnamed player A or NPC A. You know. Yeah. Uh, what was his name, Andy? Um. Well, his name is inconsequential because as soon as you got the fuck out of there, that group of that group of soldiers were more or less staring directly at Hargot. So exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. So you like, did him a mercy, yeah, you, you spared him Hargot. You definitely, okay. you definitely went uh, very. Um, you definitely made some strong choices uh, with Hargot's entrance. I think. Like, did you just like look at metal album covers and be like, hmm, "I'm gonna have like this guy holding up a decapitated guy's skull I mean, and crushing it in his hand." Yeah, like. It, like very much so that like Jimmy Jimmy brought Hargot as as one of Gron's sort of backstory NPCs and to contrast with Gron that was more or less what I was going for just fucking heavy metal um and in the first time you see him and when you return to Akros I I tried to make sure to sort of keep that through line in even describing him a bit unique compared to the rest of the other, like, horde minotaurs. Um, right. It was also before we kind of sorted out all our sound stuff and sound checked properly. Mm. So the first time Hargot speaks, it's like the, the clippiest, most distorted <laughs> thing in the whole game. Yeah, but it's great. It's great. <laughs> Let none survive. We will bathe in their blood in honor of Mogus. But it's a growing pain. Yeah. yeah. And, and and it was like maybe the first at least the first I remember, but it was the first vocal effect I remember you, Jimmy, sending us in Discord, like, look what I did. And I was like, Oh yeah. Oh, this is cool. Oh yeah. shit, this is cool. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it was the Hargot effect that you did. Was yeah. the first There's one you also, showed us. Phoenix also speaks. Well, Mogus does too, right? Yeah, Mogus all three of them. Phoenix but I think Hargat speak. was the first. Hargat was the first one you sent us. It's like, ah, here's what I'm thinking of doing, and it was like, this shit's cool. This is cool. But yeah, no, Phoenix also speaks, and so does so does Mogus, and all three of them have badass effects. That was sure. like one of the most fun things about the whole season is, is coming up with all those voices. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm excited to see what comes next in subsequent seasons. That ought to be good. Mm -hmm. Ought to be good. Um, but yeah, it was the best part about episode one is letting everyone know how Jimmy dice work <laughs> and those bindings, those bindings set us up for that. Um, um <clears throat> what you got, Scala? You said something. Oh, uh, I was just going to say, um, should we like talk about like how we came up with our characters at all? Cause I don't know if we've ever really gone Why into not? that. Yeah, let's do um, it. Mine's simple. I wanted to play a Minotaur Barbarian because it's Theros. <laughs> I, want, no. I wanted to play a Minotaur, and then I went Barbarian. That's but it. But you also wanted to have like a an idea of like what healthy, like a healthy, I forgot what the word you used was, but it was something like healthy masculinity, right? Or something like that. Yeah. It was like someone really beefy and tough. Right. That's Gron like, is a positive male role huh, model. That's it. Positive. But, yeah, but yeah. Gron also has other, and this is kind of, well, now we're getting into it. This is something that I kind of uh, didn't realize until I actually started playing the character and like exploring um, that Gron, even though I was trying to make him a positive male role model, has kind of other uh, traits that aren't so positive. Like mm. uh, he hides his feelings a lot. He has a lot of like insecurities about, uh, you know, when he his shortcomings, he's just like gets really moody about when he can't protect people and so there's like, these other parts of him that come out even though i was trying to make him like this you know strong positive guy no i i thought that was really dynamic and um you you did bring the um lifelong companion as like a big part of gron's character right from the beginning and even though we don't actually come face to face with califex until the back half of this game um 
it's it's definitely in sort of Gron's character and how he how he interacts with people. Oh yeah, for sure. Because I I wanted him to be sort of a well, he's a tank and sort of this uh, protecting the people around him kind of tank. And the um, the lifelong companion supernatural gift went right along with that, and that's where Califex came from in the backstory. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I picked that whatever that the supernatural gift before I even came up with Califex. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was great. Uh, <clears throat> clicks the. Uh... I just wanted to make a coward. Um, that was it? Because the only the only thing Andy had said was the only thing Andy said was um, from a character perspective, the theme that we want to explore is heroism. I was like, all right, yeah, let's start off as a spineless little twerp. <laughs> <laughs> and and then I guess like <clears throat> when I started playing around with the voice the timbre of Clix's voice lent itself to just not only being a coward, but just kind of being a dick for no reason. Mm. So, yeah. No, that's... And I wasn't um, also dead set on Clix growing at all. That kind of happened over the course of the... I didn't, like, it wasn't like, oh, by the end, I want them to not be a coward. And I was like, I don't know, we'll see what happens. Yeah, and, and we talk about that a lot on the Table Talks, but just the <laughs> incredible growth that we see from clicks yeah um, and al- almost all of it was improv the day we were like, you, you know just came up so yeah yeah and and we'll 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 get to that we'll get to that we'll we'll recover that <clears throat> and i suppose uh for my part uh i think i created my character last out of everyone's because i was feeling like i could be pretty flexible uh i knew i didn't want to play a character uh associated with phoenix um, because I had done that in our home game, and Jeppy had kind of already gotten like a lock on that, so that was good. Um, I think initially I was thinking of doing like a uh, an a foreign someone who was uh, very much about rules and structure and um, and sort of the social order. Uh, but I think coming back to it, I thought like if this is going to be a story about heroes. Maybe someone who's more invested in sort of the cosmic order, the mythological order of things, would be a more sort of useful character to have in that story, a character who would make more sense in that story, especially if, even though we're starting in a city, we're, like, swiftly leaving. Uh, So. Hmm. Well, like, as a listener, listening to those three characters from the beginning, you're kind of just like, how the heck... Are these three going to accomplish anything? And then as uh, you listen Andromedy. through. Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> Andromedy played a major part. Like, they were instrumental. But then as the season progresses and you listen to how each character grew, especially Clix, like, once Clix stopped being. A dick. <laughs> sorry <laughs> once once he matured a little bit you know it it really brought the party together and the way that the season ended was chef's kiss uh i guess since we'll we'll probably go into like your character creation when we get to those that episode but um from like the first three episodes and maybe even going into the next three what were as a listener, what were some of the impressions you had of those three characters? Like, which ones made more of an impression, less of an impression? Disliked, liked. Why did you dislike clicks? You know, those kinds of things. <laughs> D- does that really Je- need Jeppy to be... just wants you to shit on him a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I can shit on him in the living room. Like, just stop eating like this, please. <laughs> Fair. Just Fair. Please stop eating like this. Or drinking like this. It's so loud. Uh, uh, honestly, so Gron initially was, I, I wanted him to get out of the bindings and I, and I felt him, I felt myself getting frustrated with Jimmy Dice and just being like, why can't he break these bindings? He's a giant minotaur. Like, what's his bonus on this? Like, Plus it was a lot. Right? Yeah, <laughs> apparently these are very strong bindings. Uh, and I just felt myself 
feeling they like weren't. He needs- <laughs> they weren't. Yeah, I think it was a DC twelve. <laughs> it was very low. <laughs> <laughs> but but Jimmy Dice rolling hmm. like a two. So <laughs> exactly, and adding, I, I was probably adding five. Oh God! Jeez, yeah. Oof. You hate to see it. You hate to see it. But then um, once, but then once he breaks out, I'm like, oh yeah, here we go. And then like Andromedy, oh my gosh, Andromedy's the way that Scala, and you can almost, see, if you closed your eyes, which I listen to a lot of the podcast while I'm driving back and forth from my assignments, which is like a five hour drive. The way that Andromedy paints his there, like no, like the way that Scala paints their like narration of everything if i wasn't driving i could close my eyes and see how it it like you can visualize it it was so gripping as like an audience member and just really pulls you in and then clicks is you gonna jump or not you're gonna you're gonna do it or not and then just booking it and i i just remember immediately disliking clicks because i was like you're this person is helping you and you're like See you later, bud. I'm out of here. I don't know who you are, but uh, I got a got a plane to catch of some sort. <laughs> I think even but I think in the episode, Scala was like, "No, I'll do the same thing." Yeah, I think you it said it was that. a life or death situ- situation. Was, I did I think, say that. But real quick, speaking yeah. speaking of life or death situations, quick PSA: Please do not close your eyes while listening to Pods of the Multiverse while driving. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, important. liability, Jeppy. You got yeah. it. Our legal well, team. The, the, the the legal team sent him a PS like a memo, and just honestly listening to how Andy paints the pictures of everything throughout the entire season, but especially in the first it you know episode where it's instrumental to catch your attention, Andy, Andy, you do a very good job of narrating things, and you can, and and it's like being a person who plays. D and D over Zoom and over you know Discord, it's hard when you're not all together. And we are literally across the country from each other. And Andy paints the scene so well that I can almost tell where the parties are and where the players are and where the NPCs and the enemies and like how far, like how many squares would I be moving on an actual physical you know game board? How many squares away from Gron do I need to be so that I don't get burned? Got it. Yeah, I, well, that was that I was, was something we talked about before, you know, starting to record is like, well, we're not using battle maps and we're not like, yeah, which we did squares system. Yeah, we would do that yeah. when we played in person back in New York, like we would use those. So, like, it, yeah, that right. was interesting. I real quick, because we all introduced our characters. I think it's also worth kind of shouting out Andy as a DM, like awesome stuff. I will say well, I guess we pl- talked about player, all of our char- characters. Andy, what what draws you to Theros? Okay. You know, what, um, what do you love about oh. Theros? Yeah. Oh. So, uh, uh, thank you very much, May and 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 Jeppy and everyone. Um, I I like Theros, um, for the same reasons why I really like describing and and really diving into narration in D and D in general, and it's just this sort of larger than life vibe that you can only get in a in a game combined with a setting like this um and jimmy is holding up uh fellowship of the ring in front of the camera and i would say <laughs> that's the other 50 percent of no no no, of no, 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 no 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 that's the other 40 percent the last 10 percent is hades <laughs> yeah, shit, you're absolutely yes. right. Which, oh, which I am, I am happy to report that all five people on this call have now played Hades. So, wait, yeah, no, and Scala, it's definitely not true. Oh, Jimmy, yeah, they installed Jimmy's, it. It was Jimmy's a ten gigabyte it. install, um, and then I didn't play it yet. Scala and I played call. Hades more or less around yeah. the same time. Andy got me into Hades. He I got and Jeppy it. got me into Hades. <laughs> He and Jeppy, like, did. Jeppy made me sit down on the couch and play Hades, and I said, okay, and the next thing I knew, it was 12 at night. Yep. It do be <laughs> like do that it. sometimes. It do be yeah. like that. So, so just these, like, gorgeous scenes and very colorful and and magical, um, and, like, Nyx is just so evocative in itself. Mm. Um, and a lot of that also comes from, of course, the the card sets. 
um, which while we've been doing this, I've been getting more and more back into magic and just fucking the Theros sets are so steeped with just bitchin' art and at least for the first sets that were on Theros, really great storytelling. Um, and I wanted to take those things and I wanted to sort of do my spin on what would come next. Mm -hmm. Um, because even the book, uh, uh, Mythic Odysseys of Theros, which I used a lot of, even in just my general narrations, I would just take stuff right out of the book to describe, you know, Akros or, uh, Death Bell Canyon or, you know, these different places, um, because I really liked the writing. And, um, even the book only goes so far compared to the Theros Beyond Death, um, most recent magic set. And I was like, well, since there's no real canon lore there, I'm just going to start making shit up. And this is sort of where I ended up. Um, you know, I, I really wanted to do the existing characters in the world justice, the ones that we met in this season. Um, and sort of the established canon justice and kind of take it and, and, and make it my own. I mean, a lot is to be said, though, about like whenever Jeffy would do some dumb shit and you had to like improv, you know, your narration style is very good. Thank you. That, that's, what, that's what I was going to say, too, is just like, I think it, it was really fun as a player to just be consistently rewarded for being curious about the world. Um, that, Andy never now, says no. Yeah, Andy that, doesn't, that, that's Andy doesn't like, say no. That, but... And I don't want to spoil anything for subsequent seasons, but Andy as a player is like, well, I rewarded you. Now you got to reward me. I'm going to roll fucking insight every three seconds. I'll leave it at that. Okay, so that's that's always sort of been a DM philosophy of mine, um, because in the same vein as me sort of getting into this lore because of things like magic... Um, I got into D&D not only because I had friends who were playing D&D, you know, Scal is really the one who sort of was there to have me kind of take the final final plunge. Actually, I take that back. Um, Jimmy and sort of our original home group of of folks um, from from work friends of Jimmy's um, oh, yeah. were some That's of the right. first D&D games that I personally got into, but sort of all of us coming together collectively... Um, where am I going with this? Um, uh, you roll insight a lot. Thank you. <laughs> no, um, that <laughs> the first couple of DMs that I've experienced in in real life, um, there was a big contrast between that and some very famous DMs, um, out there, uh, sort of in the community of Dungeons and Dragons. And one of the biggest differences I felt wasn't anybody's acting chops. It wasn't anybody's painting of the setting. It wasn't even anybody's encounter design. It was simply that the DMs that I loved the most and, and, and love the most listening to or watching are ones who are constantly begging to interact with their players. Um, and I think, yeah. I think for me, that's always been the most important part is never saying no and always, if a player has an itch, always scratching it. Oh, it is good to get the good scratches. <laughs> Click, clicks, clicks would agree. That was something I didn't understand about D and D in general until, until I th I got a little more into it, and then you got really good as a DM, and it's like I did. I don't think I ever realized. You know, I've been playing here and there for mm. years, right? Um, how much the players really like build out the world like the dm comes up with all the details but it's the player's direction that really causes things to happen always um which is something i didn't realize so i i i can definitely sense scal has got something to say to that point all i'll say to that point is i think i think as a dm you need to know what your players at the table want to do in the game right why are they there to play this game and then it becomes this sort of give and take, because if you know why they're there, then you can give them things to interact and respond to. And then you can interact and respond to those. And you can sort of get this back and forth going. That makes for really, you know, dynamic situations. 
Um, I don't really have much more to add to that. Uh, I, I think there is a balancing act, though. Um, I think a lot of people, when they're learning improv, learn that the first rule is yes and. And I think that is important. Um, but, you know, part of keeping things grounded, which I feel like in a game where, you know, there are, you know, ostensibly consequences for failure and stakes, right, is you need also no but, um, mm -hmm. which is kind of the second rule. It's like you, you always keep the story moving. You don't say no hard stop. But you can mm -hmm. you can go yes and or no but and I think it's important to I think it's an important skill to develop is to know when you want to go down which path and which sort of keeps you grounded in the uh, given imaginary circumstances yeah. of the world you're playing in. And I think the idea of like no but creates tension, right? Like the character wants to do something specific and the world won't allow them, they're gonna have to figure out a way to try and do something analogous to that action. And I think that's also fun. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so just remember that, Andy, when you want to roll perception eight billion times, sometimes you ain't going to see shit in the room. You roll a, a nat 20. Well, you still don't see anything. Andy's giving me the glower of all glowers. <laughs> I have to make a wisdom, wisdom saving throw. Stop. I, feel like... I see a smile crinkling his eye. I feel like somewhere we've gotten <laughs> sidetracked. Uh, should we... Go get back no, no, I think the... I think those were those are excellent points to be made. Um, and uh, yes, uh, so second chapter, second arc, um, trials of Mount Valus, hardened in the forge and into the Ashlands, Oof. where we where we get our first taste of some boss fights. We get some excellent character growth and some more sort of consequential NPC interactions. We also get. Uh, no, go ahead. Jeppy's no, no. favorite part, and and honestly, one of mine too. Uh, I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna. I think May was already gonna talk about it. I'm gonna let her take it. I wasn't actually. Oh. I was gonna talk about. Uh, oh god, I'm so my DM for my home games will tell you how bad I am with names. Uh, is Volkos? Yep. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Volkos, oh, his voice, honestly. Do you want to know who I pictured playing Volkos? Oh, this will be interesting. Okay, who? Antonio Banderas. Ooh, oh. interesting <laughs> take. <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> he would have to gain some weight, but... Listen, there's body suits for that. Yeah, and no, like, like, You know the, you know the art for, like, Fat Thor from, the, from God of War? That's yeah. more what I was picturing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's what I was picturing, too. Yeah. Um, oh God. But I, yeah, yeah just... actually, that's pretty fucking accurate. Um. Yeah. I think on voice alone, though, Antonio Banderas does work for me. Like, yeah. Mm. If they ever needed to remake, um, remake El Dorado or any of those movies, um, you should, you should, you should put, you should throw your hat in the ring. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, uh, didn't he play Zorro? Yeah, he did. Yeah. Second yeah, he Zorro. Did. <clears throat> mention. Did? Yeah. Oh, wow. Second one. Once Upon a Time in Mexico. Yeah. Cape fighting. You learned about that today. You got to. You, yeah, Andy, I think you're the next Antonio Banderas. How do you like? <laughs> Great. <Any other> question? <laughs> you got it in the can. Yeah. Um, uh, while we're on that topic, uh, there is someone put in the show notes here. Cast your characters in the feature film. Did you guys get a chance to think about that? Oh, I, uh, I, I got all of three minutes and I decided in 30 seconds. I, yeah, but I'm interested to hear. No, Jeff, Jeffy knows, but I'm interested to hear what you guys uh, choose for your actors. Mm. Well, I thought uh, for Gran, uh, like '90s Brendan Fraser. Oh mm. my god! Okay. <laughs> yes, yes, okay. I see. All it. right. <laughs> okay. So, like, blast from the past and the mummy, like that. The mummy. Of the jungle. George, George of the, the jungle. jungle. George of the Jungle, yes. George of the Jungle. <laughs> Brendan, yeah. who is apparently making a comeback. Yeah. Yeah, it's Gron. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. Season five and season one feature film. Brendan Fraser, Gron. Hmm. Scala. 
Oh, I don't know. Like, I can't think of too many, like, uh, non-binary uh, uh, performers off the top of my head. Uh, probably because there there aren't too many of them, and I'm terrible with, with you know, the names of people and things anyway, so I never remember them. Uh... Hmm. Linguini? Oh, um... I guess, like, Sam Rockwell, but, like, Sam Rockwell, but not as cool. Who's Sam yeah. Rockwell? See? Yeah, I'm literally gonna say who? <laughs> Sam what? Rockwell. Sam Rockwell. And now I'm like, well, fuck, how do I describe him? He's been in so many things, but, like, nothing... Mind, like, nothing. Yeah, what's he known for? What's he known for? Like, Sam Rockwell kind of just is in all the things that he's in and loved for it, but he's not known for any... It's not like... Not like Titanic and Leonardo DiCaprio, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. He's known yeah. for that? I don't know what Leonardo DiCaprio. Leonardo DiCaprio is known for everything. Um, Sam Rockwell, he was in okay Moon, Hitchhiker's Seven. Guide. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah, I did a Google, yeah. and I can agree with you. Yeah, Moon. you know, I the, the vibe I would want for Andromeda is like Tilda Swinton in Doctor Strange. That, yes. that is what good. I would want. Ooh, I see that. That's Tilda good. Swinton. Ooh, playing Andromeda, basically that as sure. the ancient good. one. I like that. Andromeda is quite a bit younger, though. I would say, right? Yes. Yeah. But I, I don't think we ever actually. What's a ballpark age for Andromeda? As a human? Uh, I think they are. I have it probably writ on their character sheet, but I don't have it pulled up. They're in their twenties. I think younger than I am, maybe twenty-five, twenty-six. Uh, okay. Nice. How do Leon and age? Fuck like normal. Okay. How old they get um, a little gray around their whiskers first, and then they start losing tufts of hair, and then they get a pooch. It just swings oh, like yeah. all other cats do. <laughs> Gron the is pooch. probably the oldest among us, right? I think I also no. Gron, Gron is by young. far the youngest. I think I'm really? Gron twenty four. Oh wow! Yeah, I thought I, I thought, yeah. I thought he was going to be a much younger, like sort of eighteen, nineteen, because he's basically coming fresh out of the waste. The waste. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on. I do have it. I have it too. I'm looking up I'm looking up my age. I looked at my level and it said seven. Thirty four. <laughs> Sounds about right for you. Clicks is the 34. oldest. <laughs> I made ground twenty two. Wow. Okay. That's yeah. really endearing. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think. I, I don't really see like the ages. I mean Andromeda can sort of go either way, but I definitely felt as the game went on that clicks and Gron were sort of more like youthful naive than either of those ages i think clicks is naive but not youthful and jaded and yeah. worn down at the same mm. time yeah sure yeah uh but doesn't have a lot of awareness okay era moana feature film what do we got mindy kaling <laughs> okay yeah wow sure. yeah. yeah sure yeah it's yep. like in, yeah what are you gonna do you can't dispute it. Yeah. That's basically yeah. what it is. Yeah. I can those use... those actors. That would actually be a pretty good cast. Chip, Chippy, did we ever pick yours? Sam Rockwell. Yeah. Oh, yeah. you you said Sam Rockwell. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Uh, I, I thought you were choosing Sam Rockwell for me. <laughs> no, 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 no. Sam Rockwell for clicks. <laughs> Sam Rockwell. Because Sam Rockwell can be like, he plays characters that are walled off emotionally and self and and seemingly selfish but like have kind of have some heart underneath it i think he's really mm. good at that so yeah also he is he's part cat in real life that that helps yeah i see yeah what's re it's really you don't they take it out in post but he does have tufts of fur all around his body that he has to constantly groom man we're doing a really great job of getting through these uh <laughs> <laughs> these chapters uh hold on let me think of a quick good segue um sam rockwell cats um what do cats do oh they make biscuits that happened in episode four pretty cool yes. <laughs> there it is yeah it's my favorite <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um i will say that when i shared it to my tiktok uh, a lot of people also liked the biscuits. <laughs> the biscuits. If if there is going to be one gag that we are ever known for, I think it's it's going to be that. Great. Great. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad that I'm just going to be out there being embarrassed about not knowing 
cat terminology. I don't think it's embarrassing at all. Yeah, I thought was the, the role play yet. was good. I liked that. I liked was... how. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I don't. I don't think that's undermined at all by me being a dipshit. <laughs> You're I not think, a dipshit. No, and I think one of the most honest moments in the entire campaign was Andy just saying, "Okay, what are you trying to do? Actually, what are you trying to do?" Yep. Actually. Actually. <laughs> yep. <laughs> There's nothing more honest. <laughs> nothing more honest than Andy's true bewilderment in that moment. Like, <laughs> Yeah, talk about a no but. Yeah. Yeah, that's a no but. Like, well, you can't do that because that's not in the confines of reality. <laughs> what do you even roll for that? Um, what else, though? The biscuits were obviously, obviously great. Didn't um, butts got stabbed. I... Someone stabbed a butt. All right. Someone. Well. We're skipping over a couple of things here because I honestly think one of the oh, yeah. one of the best interactions between a player and an NPC yes, is Andy. Gron and Petros. Yep. Yes. Yep. Mm. I liked that. Oh, that. We were ready to leave. That iron we giant were gonna leave the room without doing that. Yeah. Melted my heart. Yeah. <laughs> Much like how he melts metal to make things beautiful. Is Petros okay? Probably. Okay. No. I hope so. Hargart came and kicked the shit out of Petros. I mean, his, 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 mytholo- his mythology would have you believe that he's been around for, like, ages. So, okay. one would think he's fine. That's cool. Or, or he was destroyed in the lava and was created anew, as does happen. Who knows? And he does. Probably gonna come yeah. up in season five, or we'll not. see, or or season <laughs> or, or season nine, season nine, nine. confirmed. There it is. Gron, yeah. Gron did yeet a yeti. <laughs> yep, that was cool. <laughs> yeah, Gron yeeted a yeti. That was yeah. The yeti got yeah. That was maybe um, yeah, maybe that um, Jesus, the new the new weapon that was your reward for eating a yeti. It wasn't explicitly stated, but I felt like that deserved a reward. I think the weapon was my reward for befriending a gargantuan uh, <laughs> metal monster. Yeah. 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 Also the Yeti. I liked how Andy and Andromedy played out Andromedy finding the scrolls and choosing the scrolls. So yeah. So that is one of my favorite types of things to do for downtime in home games. It's mm-hmm. just like how are we going to establish a ton of lore that I don't want to just throw at my players? We're going to turn it into, like, a library investigation, right? Um, yeah. Which, again, is not, is not wholly original to me. Like, they do, it on, they do it on certain D&D shows. Like, I just think it's a lot of fun. Yeah. You come up with a big pile of books and you have... You have people roll for him. Was that there were so many Andromedy and book slash scroll moments? Was that the one that Clicks like made fun of them for being a nerd? I mean, that happens probably, times. probably. Like, <laughs> there's a ninety you know, percent chance. Flip a coin, uh, exactly. Um, this is where Clicks dinked a nail as well. Yeah, let's mm-hmm. talk oh. about the dragon fight. Let's Best. Yeah, first, first big boss fight. Yeah, I dinked a nail. <laughs> what else? Andromedy could have died. Andromedy yeah. <gasps> could have died. I was very worried. That's true. I was genuinely concerned. Sometimes you got to roll a new character. And the music. That was the first. Oh, the music. Oh, that boss music, though. Yeah. First time, uh, first time uh, drum sets in the game. And I was very happy with how it came out. Hell yeah. That was awesome. And did, did you. Um, how did you make those drums? Did you use your MIDI controller to like tap out the rhythm or. Nope. No. Um, those are those are Garage Band like smart drums. I think is what yep. they call them. Yeah. What's the name of that drummer? Dustin or some shit. Uh, no, no, that's um. Oh my god. Um, Dustin. It's some fucking name. It's uh, like the name of the Garage oh, Band drummer. I'm, they gave I'm, it yeah, there's like drummers you can choose from. And you tell yeah, them. Yeah, I'm how, literally like, gonna pull this up right now. God. I guarantee yeah. one of them is Tyler. Um, <laughs> Garen fucking T. Let's no, see. we're going to give big shout out to Logan 
Oh my Logan. god, how did I not get Logan? <laughs> of course it's Logan. What a douchey um, drummer name. God damn it. Um but yeah, that fight was um that fight was a lot of fun. Um if your name is Logan out there, we appreciate you as an audience member. You're you're cool. You're not like other Logans. <laughs> yeah, you're different. But if you're Logan and you're a drummer trapped inside of iOS, don't listen to our podcast. <laughs> Believe me, I wish I was a good enough drummer to to do all of that. Um, Same. So shout out to Garage Band, I guess. Yeah, there's some tasty fills in there. Yeah. Um, a, a lot of those types of things, though, like the sort of how the fills were were done and the like which parts of the kit are being used at what times, that's all things that you sort of have control over. That's what makes those smart right. drums like so handy to use, honestly. Yeah, you can tell um, when, you can bring it up on the cymbals like yeah, to yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. liven it. Yeah. When you were when you were tuning that boss fight, were you nervous at all, Andy, about how it would all play out in terms of um, the CR and all that? A bit. Honestly, for that fight, compared to some of the other later ones, the only thing I was really nervous about is how um, how the breath weapons um, would impact things. Because mm-hmm. um, for dragons that are that small... Um, they were it, it was more or less you were fighting two uh red dragon wormlings um one had the sort of capabilities of the uh whatever the metal equivalent of red is i think it's bronze or brass but um at at that size that's really you know the biggest threat to a to a low level party like this um so yeah, more or less, I think it went how how I expected. Um, and again, like, I knew Volkos was there, and so that was a big th- sort of safety net uh, in my mind. Um, not a terribly impactful healer, but with some healing. Nice. Well, uh, why were the dragons there? Uh, did I not... Did I miss why... Like just lore wise, why are they I mean, actually? Because Andy wanted to write drums there. So it's it's more or less like loose association between Perforos and dragons in general on Theros. <laughs> um, <laughs> like there was a little bit, honestly, of foreshadowing for this because Thraxes got brought up a couple of times, right? Um, and so yeah, it's just sort of part of his domain. Um, they just live there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thraxes um, actually roosts in the caldera of Mount Velus. Oh. Yeah. And um the like very specifically those two, so one of them was red and one of them was more or less an anvil rot, which begs the question, so like Perforos probably like made that second one, right? Um and so you wind up with these twins, because that's also sort of a big thing with Perforos, is like his jealousy for Mogus and Aroas, he made Petros, he did all this other stuff. Um, he just likes making stuff. And destroying stuff. And then making stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so in the very next episode, after we get Perforos himself, we get another major uh, character in in this world. Um, in the Cyclops? Oh. Yep, the Cyclops, that one. <laughs> Yeah, that one, him. that one Cyclops. Yeah. There were two, and both yeah. were. <laughs> and you killed it... both of them. <laughs> Is it? Anax? Yeah, according to clicks. Yeah, Anax. Yeah, Anax hardened in the forge. That's right. Yeah, oh, that's what so his card sorry, says. So sorry. I didn't get their full name. Yeah, he, he, yeah. What were the names you, of the sh- Cyclops? So here? shout out to. <laughs> I'm going to just ignore that from Jeffy, but <laughs> shout out to, to Scala, uh, who actually named all of the episodes in this season. Yes, um, seriously. And so, so I think this is a prime example of how fucking well that went, because like you meet Anax, and so Scala named the episode Hardened in the Forge. Like, mm. just so great. Like, such a Vorthos move. <laughs> so good. And I think... Um, like- 
So back before when I was when I was actually first trying to come up with names, I did two different name schemes. I was one just about to was, mention. Yeah. One that yeah. was all like just me trying to come up with like a cool sounding name. And then another that was just the names of Theros block magic cards all the way down. Yeah. yeah. And th this one was Fall of the Hammer, right? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Um I, I, I asked that like a question. I'm literally looking at the document that is <laughs> I just gave you I just gave you a layup, but cool. Uh, and and you wrote those before the episodes were edited. Um yes. were you going off your own notes or I was yeah, memory? I was going off of like okay. my my sort of recollections of the important events of the campaign. Uh, it's yeah, and I think the reason Jimmy asked that it's worth mentioning is that episodes four, five, and six in particular. <laughs> were recorded, the only way to describe it is a fucking mess. I mean, it was just like 12 <laughs> hours. It's like, I don't know which episode's which. We'll figure it out, basically. Um, and and yeah. that's not because Andy wasn't well prepared. It was just because, you know, we kept ex doing, like, we had a lot of RP in these sessions that wasn't thought, like, that wasn't, that wasn't planned ahead. So, yeah, pretty interesting that all those name all that naming you did worked out pre-edit. Yeah, cool. glad it worked pretty out. Cool. Yeah. So yeah, the Cyclops names, Andy. I know you want to ignore that, but do you want to give us two quick ones? Uh, uh, Cy and Clops. <laughs> oh, so, wow. um, so nice. um, from there you get to um, sort of the third arc with Pandemonic Passage, Solemn Reunions, and the Triad of Fates. And I this, mean... <laughs> I think Jeppy, Jeppy told me like from more than once like from from game seven to the end of the season um well how do you describe it Jeppy? <laughs> it's fucking great like it's just it's it's, it's it's so much fun to record so much fun to role play so much fun to listen to and it's just like every fucking episode has a dumb good cliffhanger like every single one and if it doesn't have a good cliffhanger it's ending right after a really awesome emotional moment between the characters it's like every episode mm. is fun episode seven is one of the most insanely ridiculous things i've ever seen in a combat in my entire time playing D, &D which is uh, just <laughs> insane that will never yeah. be able to be repeated ever that, in ever that world. that boss fight like God damn it. it That's ballsy just... to put that table into play for a boss yeah. fight. Yeah. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> it's, again, like Theros, like crazy fucking cosmic magic. Like, well, we know that Andy expected us to run away there, right? That was probably planned as more of a chase scene uh, or some oh, sort of skill never... related escape. Uh, that and we blurb. decided to fight like dipshits. I'm going to put it in right here. That little blurb never got into no. any episode where Andy is like, consider the goal that you have right now because, again, you're level five. And I said a couple games ago that that would kind of introduce this kind of new threshold of danger for combats where some pretty brutal numbers might be thrown at you that suggest perhaps staying and fighting you know you could you absolutely could you did with the cyclops and you did fine so you absolutely could but consider everything that you all have available to you is all said anyways should be pretty exciting i had it planned a number of ways um had you sort of stood and fight and not you know just totally owned it with the power of clothis um it would have been Pretty fucking scary. Um, but yeah, just it, its name how, is Eater of Hope. Yeah, how yeah, like, it probably would have been scary. How it couldn't have gone any other way. Like, what the actual fuck? I think uh, I. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was. Uh, I I didn't tell May too much about what was happening when we were recording, but I think that was one thing where I was like. The literal fucking craziest shit happened while we recorded tonight. Oh, my God. He was like, I just remember him going, there's no way. I can't wait for you to hear it. 
Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. I said, are you, you, you going to tell me anything other than, oh my God. He's like, I can't. I, it, 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 mm. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So that was, that was literally how he was. So I spent like hours. I spent like this oh, whole second half of this campaign being like, there are not going to be roles like this again. And then Andromedy goes and rolls two 64s in the same in the, fight. Yeah. <laughs> like, for just for, like, you know, another random table thing. And it's like, well, that's basically like rolling a fucking one out of, you know, 100. Oh, it, oh, that's a 40? No, that's a four. Oh, my God. Like Insanity. So yeah. you heard it here first. Season five will have... Uh, 13 times the amount of D100 table rolls. Oh my goodness. It's, it's if we're just, being honest, probably less than half. Like, I... Yeah. It's too spicy. The spice content <laughs> well, is too much. No, there's, oh. there's, there's, there's a level of complexity that I enjoy, and then there's how th- much I tried to do in the finale. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I also think as you get higher up in levels, uh, high variance things like that, can have a very uh, multiplicative effect. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. is, as as characters and enemies become more powerful, you start getting into rocket tag territory and throwing in like zany D percent stuff can really like turn things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then you know, before we get to like the big, you know, because I think episodes eight and nine are like the true batshit territory, but. Take a moment to appreciate the heartwarming uh, reunion of uh, Gron and Califax. Pretty cool. Absolutely. I didn't, and I did not expect, I don't know, actually, like, I didn't expect that to happen in that episode. Jimmy, like, were you surprised that we just found Califax that early in the campaign? Oh, he was just right there. It kind of seemed like it was something that was a little ways off, like, but then it was like, oh, here he is. <laughs> except except actually we did we did do the scrying and actually saw that he was currently in danger and we were on our way to help him so that makes yeah, sense. it kind of yeah. had to be that way yeah so I, yeah so um i i brought this up um another time we were talking about this sort of thing how i didn't write um the ending with crufix and clicks sort of revealing Ashiok, uh, in the same vein, I didn't actually write that encounter until that scry took place. Ooh, um, cool. Like, I had always sort of had it in my mind, like where Califex would be in the world as you were sort of out doing the travel part of the adventure. Um, but then you did that, and I'm like, all right, I'm gonna put him, put him on the return. Uh, uh, on the return trek, um, and the beginning yeah. of the return trek too. Or at least it felt like the beginning. And it kind of, I guess it wasn't in terms of it, like gameplay, but geographically, it felt like closer to where you know. Well, right? that's because I no no, no okay, that's good. not right. Yeah. Sorry, Great. but cool. um, awesome. Just I I sort of made from from the Forgotten Temple through out of the Ashlands through the tunnels and back into Phoboros. I definitely was sort of much quicker pacing than what you guys were used to at that point as far as like mileage um so it it definitely felt that way but you were you were more than halfway back to acros at that point cool um but yeah truly heroic and um again sort of one of these things where depending on how how you rolled on initiative depending on how you know, sort of the combat played out, that was supposed to be a highly lethal encounter from the point of view of the Acroans. Yeah. If it's just those Acroans versus those Minotaurs, they are going to die every time. And so you came in and Gron had that top of initiative role and it was just like, well, here we then, go. And Andromeda was just like, now nah, you're going to sit in the sky for this entire encounter. Hostile I mean, levitation is great. I I will say... That one of my favorite lines that Andy says throughout the whole campaign is, but you're fine. You're Andromeda. I can't fucking touch you. <laughs> yeah, that, it comes up, that comes up later, but absolutely. Same, same emotion from me uh, yeah. in, in that fight. Um, yeah, so, absolutely. Uh, the, the yeah. Sort Blue of, mages. Yeah, the sort of support slash control 
caster is kind of one of my favorite archetypes to play in RPGs. I just think being able to change the conditions of the test is such an enjoyable thing. I I don't like dealing hit point damage. I don't like um I don't like uh I do. Yeah. Yeah, same. <laughs> I same. don't like blasting things. I like the problem solving aspect of mm. of RPG combat, I would right. say. Yeah. It's the like Kobayashi Maru. And that was that was definitely <clears throat> That was the first time you really see a Minotaur that you can't just beat to death. Um, and that sort of became a through line for the rest of the games was there's more to you just have to kill this thing. Um, which, I'm Jimmy you know, and I play Gron, a Minotaur you can't beat to death. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, again, we have the reunion and then we have uh, more or less an entire game that's not even a regular combat. Um, this, this fucking siege warfare game. Um, yeah, I mean, the siege warfare happens after we do some more kind of RP underground. Oh, yeah. And then, Please don't mm, let me skip over this because that like, where. Oh, my God. Like, yeah, we're seven through nine, like have their insane ups and downs just um like drama wise they also have like the biggest growth in really all three characters um and you know of course clicks being the most dynamic with everything that goes on between phoenix and this now this underground uh business where we encounter phaedra and the Arata. just yeah uh, um yeah there's there's so much to talk about in that little stretch yeah Session eight, no combat, but still so much happened. Yeah. yeah. And and yeah. yeah, and session eight, no combat, but by the end it promised at least one insane combat, which was delivered and then some in episode nine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um Yeah, I think, and episode, I think the... episode eight is for what it's worth my favorite cliffhanger of all of the episodes. I was literally <laughs> just gonna say that. <laughs> like, yeah. The so fact absurd. that all three characters more or less get their own cliffhangers at the end of eight. I was like this, you can't write stuff better than this. Like just the way it sort of came out organically. Yeah. Um, yeah. as player decisions, just fucking yeah. great. It's Super one of the things cool. I really like about Jeppy being a new player is mm. that he's just going to go off and fucking like, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Is like, and personal nemesis everything. by himself just like that's a bad idea in a game sense but it's so good yeah no, like, absolutely I, I the my first decision making my, my first like method for making a decision is what would my character do and that's yeah. absolutely what clicks would do like I, I don't give a shit like about whether or not it makes sense to do it from a combat for, like clicks that's what clicks is gonna do you yeah. know Clicks is going to spot his father and be like, need to kill and just leave yeah. and go do it. And then can't can't break the door down, can't get in the door. Okay, transform into my mother. That would probably get the door to open. I, mm. I, and I think that's amazing. You know, I think that because you don't have like the the like restraint. <laughs> I don't know. You you don't like you haven't you you you've been you haven't been playing the game so long that like a lot of the core assumptions that would make you perhaps a more cautious player aren't like ingrained in you. And I think that's good for all of us. Like, mm. I don't, I don't know if I would have, you know, been bold enough to open the Pixis at the end of that episode. If you hadn't first, you know, gone off and done this like wacky, risky, awesome thing at like, that yeah. like makes me want to be like recapture that feeling right. of having like never played before and not knowing what's a good idea and what's a bad idea yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and boy was it risky because that combat wasn't fucking easy at all yeah. <laughs> Oof. oh man did that did that idea of turning into your mother happen organically yeah that was um like, just like yeah we uh um 
I'll, I'll, I mean, I'll try to like list off all of them, but basically almost any big moment that happens in click for clicks throughout the whole season was just in the moment kind of thought up. I mean, Andy yeah. and my shocked, oh shit is, I think I left it in the episode. Yeah. It's yeah. Very, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's in the episode. Yeah. <sighs> oh shit. Oh, oh shit. shit. That we'll get to it when we get to episode 11, but like the whole, um, the whole Krufix thing, the whole thing with the with my epilogue, all that was just thought of it three minutes before I said I was going to do it kind of thing. Mm. Now, yeah. okay, so something I wanted to bring up about Lyukar. Now, Lyukar was uh, a close trusted advisor in the Caliphon. That is the assumption. Okay. And, I mean, I understand how, you know, they kind of smooth over what happened to him. But... I don't like was he such a bad guy other than to clicks? Jimmy. That that's an excellent uh that's an excellent thing to wonder. Mm. Or <laughs> we'll find know. out cuz I skipped all of the fucking uh um uh, wow, I can't think of the word it starts with the letter E. Exposition. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Is it eyes? <laughs> His eyes. <laughs> yeah, I just skipped all that exposition. Uh we'll never know. But Clicks would like to believe that he did a, a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Clicks needs to believe that, by the way, because uh, the character growth that happens is really resting on that fact. So <laughs> let's not question it too much, huh? Let's uh, move on. Let's go to Hargot. You fought Hargot. See, Great. I'm, I'm just going to, I'm just, the, the, the pin, the period I'm just going to put in that whole uh, uh, thought is that uh, Theros is a place where the underworld is very real. Um, so yeah, but no, but it's different. Lyocar doesn't go to the underworld because sure. I pushed him in the bath. And if famously in Theros, people that take baths upon death don't go to the underworld. Right. Underworld That's is so real good. and also for the followers of Phoenix, rather permeable. Yep. Oh. Oh, well. Ah. Right. Hargot. Hargot. Maybe Hargot wasn't such a bad guy after all. Either. <laughs> No, he Hargot was, the worst. was he was the worst one of guy. the most villainous <laughs> characters that I introduced. I'm sorry. I, I just immediately flash back to him, you know, being described initially. And I'm like, mm, no, pretty sure. Mm -hmm. Pretty sure he crushes, bad. crushes a fresh uh, uh, head um, yeah, in his yeah. palm. Yep, that's right. Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe he was just having a bad day. I mean, I'll just I'll just say like sometimes it's just fun to play a bad guy that's just a bad guy, you know? No. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, hard because that's I mean, frankly, that's what makes the more complicated villains all the better. Like, right? He's not complicated. He's just no. like a big, huge, strong, evil guy. Yeah. yeah. Is there all right? Well, like let's let's dive into the canon here, like the off-screen canon. Is there any nice thing Hargot's ever done, Andy or Jimmy? Well, well Hargot like, help a kitten across the road, like anything you can see, think of. See, Hargot, if you take him subjectively, he's really good at what he does, where he comes from, and if absolutely. You, if you drop him in the middle of Akros, that's when he becomes, you know, Evil. a bad guy. Otherwise, right. but you like know, if he is... he did the right thing when he left Gron defenseless in the middle of nowhere with Califex, that that's what that's what the situation demanded of him. So, so yeah, I don't sympathize because I played. He Gron, had to make but... some tough choices. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, we don't. Yeah, it's been hard for Hargot, and you just killed him. Real nice. I know. <laughs> I just, I just hear Jimmy. You know, or actually, it would be Gron. Just go, Hargot. Hargot. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> he's so angry. So good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's great. Great Gron stuff. Great Gron stuff. Um, so. There, there sort, of, there sort of wasn't a direct parallel that ever came, uh, that ever came to fruition. But in how I designed some of these, um, some of these bad guys, Hargot and the Wolf King were more or less like generals or or faction leaders uh, of like similar status or power scope. Um, because where, the, like, several times I say that, like, the Wolf King is, is more or less the leader of the Rage Gore, 
um, Hargot, as the strongest Bloodhorn, makes him the leader of the Bloodhorn. Like, um, that never really came across in any game because, you know, we uh, uh, just of like the point of view of the of the characters that we were dealing with. Um, but the book doesn't really go into details about specific, uh, you know, names of people uh, when it's concerning minotaurs very much at all, except for Alakia. Um, and, and a few others, um, Rordon actually being another one that's brought up a couple of times, um, who ends up being canon, Marukios's father. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun to sort of build out that side of things, uh, a little more. Yeah. Uh, I don't think, I don't know if it was ever actually explicitly stated, but Hargot came from Gron's backstory. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Just yeah, Har- Hargot and Califex being being the two two big NPCs in Ground's life, and Marukios. I mean, for that matter. Yeah, no, no, that's true. Just a sure. passing mention. You made up the character entirely, but uh, right. you know that's where Ground's name comes from. Right. Yeah, and that's all it took to sort of get the wheel spinning there. And then it ends with our our namesake. Which uh, okay. Uh, so yeah, the, the okay. final 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 act here: Oceans, Shadow, and Sand, where we get. The wonderful May, uh, mm. Kragma Descent, and Marukios the Undying. I uh, real quick before we move on to that, um, our name is the Triad of Faith, and it's just, it just I just real quick, it's really cool because Jimmy got uh, Andy, myself, and Scala, and himself a Triad of Faith's Magic the Gathering. Card. Oh my god! It's actually, yeah, yeah. It's actually right behind me on my bookshelf where my D and D books are right now. Yeah, so. I'm so sorry because when you said namesake, I thought you meant. The Marukios the Undying title. No, um, no, I mean not our, try our things, party. Which, our party. Right, of course. And and mm-hmm. the way that came about, uh, just also very, very great. Um Andromeda's yeah. little Andromeda's little um story um about that title is very, yeah. oh, very it was good. so cool. Yeah. And it's it's on brand for Andromeda, very much like we need to celebrate and and, and honor it, not in arrogance, but that is the way Andromeda would describe it. Look, Andromeda has read enough mythology to know what happens when you, uh, you know, when a, when a mere mortal gets uh, too big for their britches. Yeah, we are perfectly sized for our britches. Our britches are, it, it, they fit very nicely. And I'll leave it at that. Uh, no segue here, britches, uh, desert. It, well-fitted britches make sure you don't get sand in your pants when you're in the desert. And that's where we went in episode 10. Jesus, I gave yep. you all a layup and no one's going to talk about episode 10. <laughs> I think 10. we're all oh, looking my. at May and we're, we're all looking at May, but that's all right. I was trying because to parse whatever that transition was. Uh, <laughs> well, um, you know, sand. There's a whole bunch of stuff that happened before I even entered. That, all right, fair. Actually, that, that's fair. Um, you asked about like clicks moments that were improv uh, me giving up the Centurion's helm and donating yep. the money. That was all improv. Yep. That was yep. my, and I mentioned this in, in, in like one of the Patreon table talks. Shout out Patreon. Go be a patron. <laughs> get table talks. Um, but that my goal there was to try and renounce Phoenix. Um, and that didn't happen. Nope. Um, and instead I just donated some shit. But yeah, that was all, that was all, that was all improv. Um, and then we made our way out and. I don't know, some shit happened, but then the coolest thing happened, which was we got Aramoana and Alak... Oh, what, Andy, is it Alakia? Alakia, what is it? That one. Which one? Rainy Oracle. Olakia. 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 Like Castlevania. Yeah. Okay. Um, inspiration for Aramoana, because we went, we all did ours, and we skipped you for the time, so let's do this. Honestly, uh, so again, talked about it in the table talk, but which wait uh, real quick where where can you find that? Uh you can find that on Patreon. You That's can follow cool. Pods of the Multiverse on patreon.com. Subscribe and uh you can get access to all the table talks that happen after every single episode. Pretty awesome. You said pa- Patreon. P A T R E O N.com. That's a better plug than I think any of us have ever done for yeah, this. Yeah, seriously. Put, that, put it in every episode, Retro. Every episode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can follow us on Pods of the Multiverse at patreon.com. That's P A T R E O N. Ding! 
Yeah. Anyways, uh, <laughs> so honestly, one of my favorite, because I've been playing video games my whole life, and one of my favorite series that's very, very, very close to my heart is the Legend of Zelda series. And, uh, you know, Ocarina of Time, big, big part of my childhood, spent, I don't know, 17 years trying to beat the Water Temple as a small, tiny squirt. And uh, as, as did everybody. That shit was the worst. As did everybody. Yeah. Um, but Princess Rudo is definitely one of my favorite NPCs of the of the whole series. And um, growing up near the ocean, like I definitely had like more of an affinity to her. And as the the Legend of Zelda series has continued, the 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 Rudo have the like they have really become more streamlined and they look a lot more like tritons now and so when i was invited to play uh in an episode you know jeppy handed me the theros book and and i was looking through it and i said oh my goodness gracious i get to be princess ruto and 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 then i you know back and forth with andy we discussed it um originally supposed to be a minotaur but you know Andy gave me my wish, and it was a glorious, glorious moment where I was like, I am going to turn this valley girl into, like, this badass warrior who, you know, multi-classes. It was my first time multi-classing in something that that was complicated like that because druids and barbarians, they get funky at certain levels, like, when you're trying to do certain things, and there was a lot of dice to be counted, but, like, I had so much fun designing her. Um, like she's not a normal Triton. She's not in the water. Now we're adapting her to be in the sand. And after her, people have been, you know, in the desert for so long, like, what would she look like? What would she, you know, what would her powers be? Like, what kind of skill set would she have adapted to with life in the desert? And I think that Andy and I were able to hash it out to work great with, uh, <clears throat> the desert setting, you know, I, yeah. I, I do a lot of like, I love playing druids. They're one of my favorite classes to play. And, um, sometimes I do like Tony Hawk pro skater stuff. Uh, like when, please it, elaborate. When it comes to, like... <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm so, not like, following, but I want to be, <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, uh, like, I don't know. I'll just be, um, a, spider on the roof and all of a sudden like oh, okay. wild shape into a dire wolf and bounce off a border like a boulder and like you know attack you know the enemy that's right there who mm. had no idea that i was even there you know like i just like doing funky crazy cool stuff like that with druids and i was able to do that with the crocodile which oh what a highlight I'm what a highlight! <laughs> so good. It's just, yeah, and re- 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 like some some behind the scenes made better by the fact that you and I live in Florida. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I, yeah, 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 I, yeah. I, yeah. Don't know, I, um, I, I don't know how, but yeah. <clears throat> so, because like, uh, that's like all Florida is known for, right? Is like alligators. And, oh, alligators! That's all a New Yorker oh. would know Florida for. <laughs> and Shit. hurricanes. And just, and just, Florida, just, man. just confirm that we are New Yorkers. Anyways, <laughs> Jeppy tangents aside, um. I think I think May also brought just an energy that was so different than than you know what our table has on its own that it just made for such a fun game. Yeah. Um and and there were definitely some, you know, there was just as much lore as any other game, you know, from my side of the table, but to just put all of this sort of spin and and spice uh uh with with Air Moana and Lakia it was it was very very good yeah i i remember being very nervous uh starting the episode with you guys cuz i had never done like a recorded episode before like it's always just me and my friends you know just having fun and then i just remember being so nervous and just being like oh my god like I don't want to ruin this for them. Like, I love what they've been doing. Like, you know, so, they're little, having little, so much fun. A little bit of a little bit of a, a parallel there in the same way that you had those feelings um, in our first in our first game of this of, of Theros. Um, you know, I got done sort of 
with the first narration and we cut to Gran and you know if you don't mind me saying there was this little bit of like hesitation and I was just like you know this is it like no matter what we do like <laughs> right. here we go yeah, yeah you go from yeah. yeah you like you're reading into a microphone and then suddenly it's like all right now I have to make a decision on the microphone right you know? it gets recorded right yeah yeah like being able to to play in person is is you know definitely so organic but what was really fun was playing with you guys as you know and i've never played with you all um you know D D, i've never played with you guys and and it was just it was so fun to to see how a completely different party plays in a totally different arena, in a campaign that I'm literally just being plooped into. And I don't know any of the backstory, which really helped um, when it came to, because Air Moana knows, you know, nothing about it, you it, all. It, exactly. From more or less like a character perspective, it it worked really well. Yeah. I, w I enjoyed that you allowed me to Sailor Moon my my rage. That was fun. And Those descriptions were clutch. Just, <laughs> just from my perspective, like we had just had some really, like heavy stuff happen, right? We had just gotten to sort of the climax of the story, and we were going, we were like sort of headed into the falling action. Things had been quite serious, and I think you brought this level of just joy and levity, and. Uh, nonchalance i would say that uh, that was was very needed at that point in in the story yeah Absolutely. oh that's great i had no idea right <laughs> but yeah, yeah like it I wasn't mean, well, Je yeah jeppy being my partner aside like i i don't he doesn't tell me anything that's going on like sometimes when he's super super excited like he'll you know tell me little bits and pieces but nothing that would spoil it in any way, shape, or form. Uh, my genuine reactions to the episodes are all 100% organic, and I had no idea that you all had just gone through such heavy stuff until I listened in the episodes, and I was like, okay. Yeah, but I like, because it didn't, like, your character had the Valley Girl voice, but, like, it, your character also had a really awesome, compelling backstory that like makes me grateful that Andy was like not Triton, Sand Triton. Um, and I think all of that, like, I think it's, what is what was the word that you used, Scala? It was uh, le levity. Like, I think that's a great. It's not silly, but there's levity to it. There's a lightness to it that I think was really, really, uh, really paired well with where we were at from a campaign perspective pretty cool yeah she yeah. she wasn't originally gonna have a valley girl voice it just kind of after listening to you all and uh, i side messaged andy and was like can i do this and, <laughs> and andy andy and i just he started laughing and he said yeah and i was like yes yeah and then, you and messaged Scala. me that during the game before your first appearance Jesus. like that was <laughs> that was like happening live that she was yeah. like yeah i want to do this and i was like okay <laughs> that makes it even better yeah oh yeah <laughs> so, just, oh there's God. the laugh there's the laugh um and i actually real quick shout out too so perfect it was amazing and i also think what helped too is that alakia right yep yeah. yes you got alakia, it alakia like also had some levity to her as a character you know like her her oh. her voice and just like the little bop that she get like all of that was uh, the right amount of fun factor that yeah it was and great. i think it, it, i think having those two npcs be linked together and in the same episode helped both of them feel like they belonged in that episode together and in the campaign as a whole so i thought that that, that was well done too Granny Oracle was... I love the, the pizzazz that you gave to her. Granny Oracle. Yeah, that, that, that was a lot of fun. And again, you know, the game, the season so far had seen oracles in the color of Andromeda, a Polymede, a Volkos, of uh, Arissa. And Alakia comes in and really gives you a, a very 
different flavor of what an oracle on Theros can be like. Um, mm-hmm. Because for all of her sort of levity and, and you know, charm, um, she is an oracle of Mogus. Um, you know, yes, also like of Afara, and that's a big part of her character, but sort of this more, um, this more sort of ancient practice, um, this more um, sort of uh, uh, occultish oracle um, than than a lot of the other flavors that you get. I mean, um, you definitely get a taste of it when they're all sitting at the campfire during the first rest mm. when um, Alaki is having her monologue and you hear a very, the way that you enunciated the sentence like, and we love him for mm. it. To think that the god of slaughter be so crude. The god of slaughter, crude. Well, yes, he is a little crude, isn't he? But we love him for it. Like, I just could see Alakia's teeth. Yeah. And like a snarl. Yep. And it was just like, you could tell she's not 100% good. She's not bad either, but like, you could definitely tell she she ain't with Akros. She's definitely with Skofos. Mm. Definitely there for that. Hell yeah. And then, of course sort of a segue from oracle to oracle you get kind of the the hard pivot in color to actress mm-hmm. um which yeah yep yep <laughs> <laughs> that was a fun fight i like that fight <laughs> that was um, that was uh, yeah yeah i don't want to skip over anything but I, you know in the theme of May asking, you know, when I planned certain things, that was when I switched from Phoenix to Crufix. My plan was always to denounce Phoenix at some point after killing Lyukar. Like the idea that Clix would have served a god just for the purpose of kind of becoming stronger to do something he wanted to do made sense to me. So, like, the idea was always to get rid of Phoenix, but the idea of switching over to Crufix because now Clix has this new point of view about life came. Literally in that moment, or rather, while we were oh, recording wow. that episode, yeah. Um, so, um, like, I think the idea was planted real, just real quick. I remember the idea being planted in my head of like gonna gonna renounce Phoenix, and I remember, I remember knowing a little bit about Crufix and saying, I think I might switch to Crufix. Let me read the book and learn a little bit more to make sure I like this idea. And I read the I read Theros while we were exploring uh, exploring the dungeon. Like that's how last minute that idea was. Yeah, I had the shit. book wow. had the book in my lap and I was like, okay, crew, yep, yep, that works, that works, that works. And then I came up with the idea and did the dialogue in the middle of that combat. Wow. So that was that was a fun combat. And then I had mage hands that that's, I didn't really that's use. Some that spicy much. stuff. That is inspiring. Yeah, the way, um, I don't think I used mage hands any more than that combat. Nope. Um, it's not, it's, and that's unlike me to like have something in my kit and never use it or forget to use it when it's relevant. I don't. I never do yeah. that. That's I'm always really good um, about, about that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, again, this was another sort of things that are improv that become like so tremendously impactful to the game as a whole um, and the story, um, especially in these final episodes, how all of this fell into place was just so great. Um, that encounter um, was another one of these that like I had only sort of vague ideas of what I wanted to accomplish because unbeknownst to Jeppy, um, I always wanted to give clicks a comeuppance and the way it unfolded uh, was just so tense and then how it resolved was just so epic. Um, When you say comeuppance... Well, I mean, Andromedy was sort of calling this the entire time, right? right? Yeah. Like this, you know, mm-hmm. when you deal with, when you make deals with Phoenix, it's, you know, it's the god calling the shot. And um, after Lyukar, it was very clear that I was like, all right, well, that wasn't enough of a sort of catastrophe for clicks. Um, we need to raise the stakes one more time. 
Um, and much in the same way, Jeppy, that you were like trying to ditch Phoenix in donating all of that stuff to the Acroans. I was like, there is there is a goal that Phoenix has always had, an angle that Phoenix has always had with you in this party. And you start to see what that is, and you you learn what that is through the encounter with Atris. Um, Phoenix wants power, and delivering the creation's eye was his big play. But then it got mage hands. That shit didn't happen. <laughs> and Gron made a daring jump, which didn't really work out. Gron also got cursed by some gold. <laughs> that's that's all Phoenix's fault. That's not Clix's yeah. fault. <sighs> Something Sorry I like about that, just from a from a Vorthosy perspective, is Atris's card when you play him, uh you your opponent looks at the top three cards of your deck and they put two they make two piles, one face up and one face down, and you have to give you have to give your opponent something when Atris shows up. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I used to I used to flicker him with Thassa, and it was fun. Anyway, uh, <laughs> not important. But I liked how Atris showed up, and you had to give him something. Yeah. Yep. Pro- it's almost lore. it's almost as if yeah it's almost as if there's a there's a lore nerd DMing and creating these <laughs> or, encounters or a couple <laughs> or a couple or a couple of them um, yeah uh, yep. And then I guess was there? I mean, anything else huge in episode eleven? Or uh, I definitely Califex. think that was sort of the the big moment. Um, Califex got banished. Yeah. yeah, and and again, you know, just taking taking these little moments and and picking at them, we see some some real larger consequences of that happening um, in the finale, um, in in the epilogues. Um, we bring. Uh... It is Elspeth, right? I suppose we can spoil that here. Because <laughs> yeah, it's, again, not a spoiler. Right. Um, um, yes, teasing literally Elspeth's nightmare. Um, the saga um, represented here in the final epilogue between Gron and Califax. But before we get to that, mm-hmm. shall, we, shall we talk about that last boss fight? That was a great fight. That was a mm. great encounter. It was really good. The music was good. Yeah. The there were some fun moments. My character tripped acid, basically. <laughs> it was challenging. Um, things felt really tense. I don't want to like gloss over. I'm just like rattling off my favorite wow. things. And the did. best thing ever was that. Well, I was just gonna say we did talk about this in depth just last week. And yeah, for where only do we five talk dollars a that? month on Patreon? Yeah, you can hear <laughs> right. our uh, right. in depth yeah. post mortem. Yeah. I think yeah. something I didn't say last week is something I really appreciated as sort of a problem solver is that each phase of the fight sort of required different sets of like using using like your abilities to solve problems in a different way uh, than the previous one, at least for me. Uh, mm. I uh, we did talk about this in the in the episode 12 table talk that you could listen to theoretically if you were to um, <laughs> subscribe Jesus. to our Patreon. Okay, uh, but the but no no but the the killing don't blow, do it for the like, money. The killing you're blow. really milking it. Yeah, I think we are. I know it's oh my god. And we another you know, yeah. Speaking of that, we if you don't like cow puns, the Patreon's a great place. We never make cow puns in the Patreon either. So, <laughs> um, but no, the Can killing the killing steer, blow. Steer it and steer it in another. Yeah, direction. we'll steer it back. We'll steer it back to the combat. Um, the killing blow was just. It could, it could, it, it, like, I feel like the way you described Andy, like the, the episode eight cliffhanger things just lining up perfectly, like the fact mm. that that combat organically got to a place where Andromedy came back at the last minute for a crit hit killing blow on the big bad. Oh my God. It's so yeah. cool. I like, think that how... entire last, last turn was like <sighs> probably the most dramatic turn in the entire season. Yeah. Is, isn't that. And correct me if I'm wrong, but that was the first and only boss fight that Andromedy did a killing blow. Hmm. Yeah, probably. I think only battle. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I I did get some no, there, like there killing were, blows. There were lots Mooks of other painted pictures. Actually, um, because um, you had the really cool one, the eyeballs. 
Yes, the, the, the magic missile against magic the random. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. the um, the simulacrum didn't Andromeda get the killing blow on Atris? Oh yeah, I I yeah. fucking grasped yeah. him to oh, death. Yeah. yeah. Oh um, yeah, yeah, that's right. Would have been great if a moth fart took it out though. <laughs> <laughs> would have been. Um, <laughs> But, but yeah, that's, that's just that's the, just good combat design, frankly. That's I mean, not the that's not the kind of character Andromeda is. Um, they spend a lot of effort, sort of uh, repressing their tendencies for violence and and violent outbursts and rage and farts uh, and farts. Um, <laughs> no, they don't. They're, they're a normal person. They fart like everyone else. <sighs> But, even in, even know, in table talk, I hate, I derail everything. I'm sorry. But you know, when there's when there's some uh, when there's some evil mage who's gonna try and mess with destiny, then then the rage comes out, and they're gonna get you. Hey, boyo, you don't mess with destiny today, boyo. That's so, not what Andromeda um, sounds like. Thank <laughs> God. Yeah. So, sort of segueing here into uh, the reveal. Of the Nightmare Muse. Um, Pretty. So I had never seen the Ash Yacht card until we talked about it in the table talk for episode mm-hmm. 12. Patreon.com. Um, <laughs> oh my God, that my card God. is <laughs> badass, though. That card is yeah. fucking cool looking. Awesome that it's an NB villain. Badass looking card. I cannot fucking. I don't want to talk too much about it, but I cannot fucking wait to see where that goes. In season five, in 2022, or well, whatever. Well, I, I, I think, you know, sort of as we as we talk about these last couple of games, I think we can also be talking about what we think. Um, I'm particularly interested, you know, in what you guys think about um, what's next for our heroes on Theros. Uh, I mean, so where we left clicks, I'm eager to see how... because. Cl- we left Clicks in a place where he very well may be on his own for a little bit. Maybe. Maybe not. Or will be returning to Clicks after he has spent some time alone, right? Because the ending kind of insinuates he's going to go on a journey and try to find find somebody, right? And go to a new place. I'm curious to see what new Clicks is like um, after some time alone. And uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm eager to see what that, how that takes shape. Um, and... Yeah, I think that's, See, it's that's... interesting. It, it's interesting that you immediately say like, "Oh, he's going to go back to being alone." Because the way I see Clicks ending is like, Clicks and Gron are in it together. Like, yeah, I I agree with Andy. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, and we're neighbors now. No, 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 no yeah, yeah. I'm saying like the the <laughs> the end the end of the end the final scene with Clicks is him reading the Tome of Understanding, right? With the idea of going to, I believe it was Melitus, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I. I could see a world where Clicks just goes and checks out Melitus alone. Like Gron may or may not go with him. So I'm curious like what that'll play out. Like like what is you know, I don't I don't think Clicks wants to be alone. Like I believe firmly that Clicks views Gron as a friend and companion. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's something that Gron is gonna join Clicks for. So I'm very but do you, knowing Gron, would Gron let Clicks go by himself? Uh probably not. Yeah. I I as the as the characters progress, like I think that they would all want the party to be back together again. Yes, and find mm. someone someone very Scala like probably on our journey. <laughs> yeah, because Andromedy's not exactly yeah. an option. And Andromedy has to do what they have to do. They they need to fulfill their destiny and uh, do magical knitting over the seal of the Titans, um, which is again a place where I'm happy to leave them. Um, but I think sort of as we return to Theros, I would like to try a, like a different slice of the color pie out. I would say Andromedy was uh, as a follower of Clothis, uh I would say uh, red red green. Um, and I think I would, and that's sort of an ally color pair, a color pair that deals in sort of synergies and sort of two sort of complementary ideas supporting each other. And I would want to try something that's an enemy color pair, something that is uh, two sort of opposing ideas in a sort of dialectic with each other, exploring their contradictions and 
um, I can't think of the other word, but exploring their contradictions. And that's all I'll say as yeah. <laughs> to, to any of you. Andy knows what I'm going to do, though. Oh, it's... Oh, can't fucking wait. 2022, <laughs> it's almost here. Yep. <laughs> yep. July 4th, um, 2022. Did you look at a um, calendar and, like, that's actually the day it would... I actually did, yeah. It would be the same week oh. because we are on a one-year weekly release cycle for four oh, seasons. Yeah, so, so it'll be the same week next July. This this was sort of just a part of the closing commentary um, that I had in those last moments of that finale. Um, but where I say um, the Protector Gron, the Slayer Clicks, the Oracle Andromedy... Um, those are named archetypes in the Theros book um, mm. that, again, just one of these things as a DM, I'm like, oh, my God, they're falling into this just like organically, like it can't get any better. But um, that's sort of going back to um, a big reason of why I like Theros is there are these these classical in in a classical mythology sense uh, archetypes that are sort of outlined in the beginning of the mythic odysseys of theros um and those are three of them that are outlined um in in you know and this is talking about you know oedipus and odysseus and all of these uh you know blanket uh characters um you know the the book says you know the general the protector um the vanquisher the hunter um the slayer the provider the slayer the philosopher and the oracle and it's like just so cool how how that just you know we landed on three of them and it's yeah like, yeah we definitely did that is pretty cool i had That's no insane. idea yeah i'm glad to see i'm glad to see that my concept for my next character is also is also uh, there and we're not gonna say which list. one <laughs> yeah oh i'm excited <laughs> Yeah, I'm excited. I know. I mean, I know. I know a little bit about that character, and I'm I'm jazz. But yeah, it's gonna be really cool. Um, if Era Moana were one of those archetypes, I'm asking Andy, since you mm. know them better. Which one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was like, don't ask me. Um, that is an excellent question. I'm gonna say probably the warrior. That's pretty cool. Yeah, for sure. We'll take it. That's pretty cool. And can we say on air we might be seeing Ara Moana again soon? Uh, I think that's, that's okay to say. Um, yeah, we have some ideas about how to uh, how to take a take another look at everyone's favorite uh, Mean Girl Triton. And uh, <laughs> hell yeah, hell yeah, big on fan. On Wednesdays we wear uh... the skulls oh. of our enemies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I don't know why I like blanked on what creature Gron was. I was like, it's a bull. It has horns. It does the <laughs> thing with the things with the malls. And I was like, and it's gone. Other things in the near future, if if you'll permit me. Um, I think we're I think we're just about there. Yeah. Uh, I am very excited for you all to be able to listen to the campaign that I've uh, had the pleasure of running for these fine folks. Uh, it is certainly a sort of change of pace, change of, I would say, flavor, but I think it is a lot of fun. There's like great dynamics with the characters. Uh, I think there are some really fun and cool encounters, and I'm really excited for everyone to listen to our next adventure in Ravnica, a sprawling ecumenopolis where towering spires and glittering domes form a skyline that swallows the horizon. You want me working with other guilds? But they don't know anything about anything. Here, ten factious guilds vie for power from the deepest bowels of the Undercity. You should think better of the Golgari. 
to the sanctified apexes of cathedrals. Any venture in Ravnica can be turned profitable as long as I am involved. Last night, the sun disk with very unique magical properties went missing. We'd like the three of you to recover it. A half-elf of questionable character and questionable ends, Illipel is usually the most important person in a room. Clork is average height for a goblin. On his hip is a tool belt, heavy with devices both mundane and unusual. Your anti-magnetic deflector panel, hyperharmonic catalyzer, you know, just the typical lab stuff. A young human man, eminently surrounded by spores, like noxious thorns. Generally at all times, I'm traveling cloaked. I was sent by Vim, who's in charge. You should report to Clark here. That's right, don't forget it. I can't help but feel like I'm a rat brought just now to the center of its maze. So we're looking for a frog elf? This won't be the first time I've run into Simic under foul circumstances. Mutual understandings are also a key part of our little civilization. We're gonna take part in the violating of inviolable rights and evict an honest worker? Did you expect this journey to be full of nothing but answers you like? They seek to distort and destroy the cycle of nature. And they flash out jagged blades as they fly towards your party. Clark raises up his wrench, which starts to kind of crackle with chaotic energy. I just take my mallet and I drive it through its head, exploding in necrotic energy. Illipel will whisper a message. Now look where you've ended up. In a trap, unable to get away from something that you know will be your undoing. Who are you? attempt to interfere in my design. Can I make it explode? It's a fucking nat 20. <laughs> yes! Oh my god. I can't believe you've made me do this. Describe it for us! Please! <laughs> okay, so we just like pretend that the trailer just played? Yeah. Okay. Describe it for us! <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh man, those bells! Those uh, freaking yeah. bells! Um, I love them so much! I'm so excited. Um, you know, it was so much fun uh, running Theros, uh, but to jump in as a player uh, was just great. And the music obviously is going to have a different flavor because the whole setting is going to have a different flavor. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, for everyone here, that that is sort of the key, uh, one of the key things about our show is when we all take turns running these games for each other, we want them to have our own flavor, um, the things we like doing, the things we like expressing. And I think this flip from, from, from me to Scala is uh, an excellent expression of that notion. Oh my God, um, yeah. Yeah, and, and, the things, and the settings, like Theros to Ravnica could yeah, not be... Uh, one yeah, one of the things I would like to sort of yeah. put out as like a primer and a way that I sort of approach this, I guess, is uh, the sort of way that each of these worlds was conceived is our, uh, in terms of like magic creative design, is kind of opposite. Theros was a top-down design designed world where the the... Uh, superstructural concept of uh, Greece, gods, heroes, monsters came first, and then all of the card mechanics were built to sort of undergird that central idea. Mm -hmm. uh, that was sort of built from the top down, whereas Ravnica is built from the bottom up. There's these ten, or there's these ten possible color combinations of all of the five colors, and how do we build on top of that? And you get this very sort of complex sort of sim this weird sort of synthesis symbiosis in this very very cramped but also very uh, um very like mysterious sort of cityscape and i have such a great time playing around with that sort of uh idea that sort of has that is that is down to its bones built around these sort of colors and how they interact with each other. Yeah. Um, so. So. On that note, as we transition uh, from one setting into another, folks, that is a wrap on the first season, a wrap on the first campaign in Theros. We will return to these Theron heroes, the Triad of Fates, 
in a later season. And we leave you now looking forward to a new set of heroes on Ravnica. And that, that is the public table talk. Thank you so much. You can listen to more of that on Patreon. <laughs> Have we said it enough times? <laughs> Um, Search pods of the multiverse. P a t r e o n dot com. Uh, so I right. think um, I think that's Theros. Per- <laughs> God damn that's, it, that's, Jeffy! That's, 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 that's Theros table talk. 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 Is this table talk? Surprise! This was the table talk the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> You guys did it! Yeah! Pods of the Multiverse is produced by Jimmy Afadigato. That's me. With music by Andy Berger and art by Alexa Riley. Subscribe to this feed to get a new episode every Monday. Check out the links in the show notes. You can support us by visiting our Patreon, joining our Discord, or sharing this episode with a friend. We want to give a special shout out to our Holy Avengers, Jake, May, and Chris. For $10 a month on our Patreon, you too can become a Holy Avenger. Thanks for listening. Take two. I moved my mouse so the audio wave looks like the number two. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. I mean, I think we're all okay with this edit taking weeks. Even as long as this session was, I know a lot of that is just going to get cut from, from being mechanics. I feel like we're not even close to nine being nearly that long. How long do you estimate it will take? 20 minutes. Okay. Did you say 20 minutes? He said, okay, so that's right, so 40 minutes. minutes. <laughs> 59 minutes. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Three and a half hours. Got it. Okay. Fuck you guys. The end of whatever game this is going to be at is going to be when they ask you what your party is called. The pods of the multiverse. No, I'm just kidding. Fuck right off. Yeah, no. Real names. Owen? They gotta be Greek. Okay. Owen Os. <laughs> Seriously. Grom looks at his watch. Fuck off, Grom. <laughs> Start your shit. Jeppy, don't... Y- hey, you hey, don't... hey, this is Greece. It's a sundial. What's that? Yes. It's a sundial. It's a small sundial. Right, um, yeah. And we end up in this city. In this polis. Fuck off. And the three of you are within this ruined watchtower. Oh. Oh. Giant open maw. <laughs> that's, the, that's the sound of the cave. Yeah, you know that sound caves make. Yeah, it's like a closed mouth burp. Well, <laughs> right. Andromedy. Almost, anyway, yeah, whatever. Let's get uh, back into like it. That was like a Rick and Morty thing. Oh, sorry. Fuck that. <laughs> nope, keep it in. Keep it, keep it in. in. Just, you know how many Clips. of those I took out? <laughs> so many. Set up a suspicion. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> that, those weren't even words. I'm so tired. Can you take one line again for me, too? Uh, Gron leapt into battle. Gron leapt into battle. Thank you. Thanks, Jeppy. You're welcome. <laughs> now okay. I need to find where that goes. Well, you know, um, I'm sorry. Oh, it's, it's a syntax like thing, that. wasn't it? It's yeah. a syntax thing, it which was. is literally you like we're never going to get a single viewer on episode 10. That's fine. Yeah, I, People I are like, I'm 10 hours in and they don't know left and leaped. I'm out of this. This is fucking stupid. Innervating. Innervation. Innervation. Yeah, innervation. 14 piece. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 14 piercing yeah, piss damage. Uh, 14 piercing damage. Revealing more and more of my mus- muscle muscles. Muscles? More and more of my muscles. <laughs> yeah. Also, the word hesitantly in there was a little. Yeah. And you said uh urn. Technically, it's an urn. Right, there was, you know what? I, I actually had a list. You guys <laughs> fuck right off. There's no, no T I... on the end of the word across. Piece of shits. <laughs> Sorry. So thirsty. Uh, Jeppy, what the fuck? (laughs) I heard a cook in the kitchen far away. It sounded like he is making ice cubes with water. Is that what that sound Um, was? It sounded like he just threw a bunch of plates on the floor. Yeah. (laughs) When you drop an ice cube into it, it sounds like a fucking volcano has erupted inside of a tin factory. Tin factory. Um, yeah. Hey, listen, this time I muted when I went to go get ice cubes. <laughs> no, listen to that fucking... Thank you. Yeah. The anvil factory making ice cubes. <laughs> Disgusting. Yeah. Where's that bird? Who's got yeah, that bird, bird in there's a bird in somebody's mind? video. It's a bird that goes... We're getting a lot of... Okay. 
Shit. Let me just go ahead and pull this up here. If it's rules adjudication, just ask Scala. Narrate as if you are killing yeah, me. I mean, we're going, we're phasing. <laughs> Got it. Real. Yeah, the next phase. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> You're on to my schemes. Hargot's using Game Shark, I think is what's happening here. Uh, back no. on the top. You, you missed me. Oh, uh, and I thought you did, and I said something, wait, and you didn't say anything. Wait. I, I was like, I knew you said, wait I a minute, and I was like, you forgot my initiative, because you always forget mine. And then you just plowed ahead, and I fucking knew it. What do you call it? Canyon. Canyons. Ravine. Canyon ravines. Cr crevasses? Chasm. Chasm, there you go. You're welcome. This ominous chasm. No, I just think that, of, like, the, the tiger's mouth. In Aladdin. From Aladdin. Absolutely. Yes. I mean... It's All caves are lines. shaped like tigers. P being doing people things. Jeppy and his goddamn work friends. God damn it! There's so many of them. Um, are they all named like Matt? There's one named Mike. Uh, <laughs> oh, that, I, I, God! I almost what? said Mike. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> said Mike. Make a deck save, bruh. <laughs> Uh, 69. Nice. Nice. The tiramisu. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Clicks. Oh my god, I fucked up so much. You're doing your best and I appreciate it. 